This is the Passive 25K Podcast, a podcast built around the vision of creating wealth through passive income for ourselves and others. The idea of creating income while you sleep seems like a dream come true, but for most professionals, turning this into a reality is a different story. On this show, you will hear real people breaking passive income streams down to the basics, giving you the next steps to start your own passive income journey. If you're new to the show, my name is Kyle Reedstrom from Fargo, North Dakota, where I get to work with my team of agents and investors each day to complete our goal of $25,000 a month in passive income. Now, let's get right into our next conversation. This is the Passive 25K Podcast with Kyle Reedstrom. It is episode eight today, and I am super glad to have our friend David Dodge on. We're talking about wholesaling real estate, plus the Burr strategy. David, thanks for being on today, man. Hey, Kyle. I'm so happy to be here, man. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah, my goal is going to be to provide as much value to the audience as I can. So let's do this, buddy. I love it, man. Hey, and here's the, here's the cool part, David. We were just getting prepped. We jumped on and David's literally at a house next door <laughs> right before this podcast. So, I mean, how, how much more appropriate can it be? Man, right. just give us a quick little window. Tell us the story about this. This is, this is, this is really cool. So you've been trying to buy your neighbor's house? Is that, that? Yeah. So Kyle, I do appreciate you hanging in there with me. I was a few minutes late here. Um, so my neighbor, is uh has there's a vacant house in my neighborhood it's like three houses down i can see it out of my front window and it's been vacant for oh i don't know maybe about a year and i've been trying to get a hold of the seller and buy it and i've been playing phone tag with this woman for probably three months maybe even four <laughs> months and she called me today around 2 p.m and was like you know it was about three hours ago and she's like hey i'm gonna be at the house this afternoon you know cleaning some stuff up and and and, and working on it if you're going to be around or in the neighborhood, you know, come on over and take a look at it. And I said, hell yeah, I'm going to be around. I'm going to come take a look at it. So I just went over there and walked the property with her and, you know, just built rapport and told her who I was and that I lived across the street. And she knew a lot of that already. Uh, but I just told her, you know, I'm always looking for deals and I'm always looking for properties. And um, my, my wife and I are actually going to be starting a family at some point here soon. So we're also looking for a bigger home. And oh man, I'd love, to, I'd love to stay in the neighborhood. And that's what I told her. So she loved the fact that, you know, I was uh, already in the neighborhood and I was familiar with the property and all, you know, all the neighbors and, you know, the house is dated. It was built in 1957. Um, so, you know, it's 70 years old mm -hmm. and it's, uh, it needs everything, you know, it, it needs to be gut to the studs. And that's what I do, though. You know, I buy yeah. houses up for, and sell them for a profit. I also buy properties and rent them out. And you had mentioned, you know, the Burr method. The Burr method is really my passion. So mm -hmm. it was a good opportunity to go meet, the, go meet her. And the woman that I met with isn't the owner of the property. It's actually her parents. Okay. Uh, her, her father recently passed, and her mother's in a memory care uh, facility. So she's the trustee or the executor of their estate at this point so, so she okay. will be the she's the decision maker even though she's not the owner if that makes sense that makes sense man so i Dude, just told and, her and, you know i'm looking for a new property though so hopefully she'll sell it to me i love that man and it, i love the uh relevancy of you you know you're coming on the the passive 25k podcast you're in the world of real estate all in and you're always looking for deals man you're always you're always having opportunity you're always following up with people on uh, on opportunity. And before I get ahead of myself, I really want to introduce you to our audience with your bio because David, you're one of the most decorated real estate investors we've ever had on the podcast. Man, we love what you're doing. If you're not following David Dodge right now, check him out. He's a great follow. He's always putting out value. David, I've been watching you from afar for a long time. Um, but here's the bio uh, and kind of introducing you to our, our audience. Yeah, let's, let's hear it. So David Dodge is a real estate, a St. Louis real estate investor with over 18 years of experience. Uh, his, he first started real estate investing when he was in college at the age of 20 while attending the University of Missouri Columbia. Mm -hmm. David specializes in wholesale real estate, wholesaling real estate, as well as the Burr method to acquire rental properties with none of his own money, which I know that a lot of our audience's ears just perked up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Uh, he also loves teaching others how easy it is to learn how they can too wholesale real estate for huge profits and how they can use other people's money to buy rental properties. Very relevant. Mm -hmm. David and his team have wholesaled over 750 houses to date. David also loves to fix and flip properties as well as add properties to his rental portfolio. And this is where I love when you're doing posts about this, David. David has over 90 rental properties currently and over 20,000 in cash flow. And he has a goal to get his real rental portfolio over 200 properties in the next 24 months. Now, I don't know when you wrote this. David, where are you at in that goal right now, man? Um, I actually just wrote that a couple of weeks ago. I'm at 92, okay, good. Yeah, I'm at 92 units. Um, the cash flow, the passive income from the portfolio yields about, it depends, you know, roughly, roughly 20 grand a month, you know, some months 16 or 18, some months 22, 23, right? So depends yep. on the vacancy, depends on the maintenance and any capital expenditures that we may encounter. So, you know, roughly it brings in about 20 grand a month passively, which is, which is pretty sweet. Uh, we're at 92 units and, uh, my partner, Mike and I, so I, I have a partner, we, we both would like to have 100 single-family homes each. Mm -hmm. So that means that we collectively need to get to 200. I um, love it. So of the 92 units that we own, about 65 of those are single-family homes. Mm -hmm. And the other, you know, 25 to 30, whatever that number is, uh, is, is uh, multifamily. So we don't do a ton of multifamily, but we are starting to do a little more of it. But we've been... You know, we've been buying and selling single family homes for 17, 18 years. I've mm -hmm. been doing this business full time for going on about eight, you know, so. Yeah, man, that's yeah. and you have three books out and I want to make sure the audience see here's these the ultimate guide to wholesaling real estate, the Burr method and the three pillars of wholesaling real estate. Also have your podcast out there, mm -hmm. uh, the discount property investor mm -hmm. and man, you have the quote in here and I love the quote and I want to, I want to kind of have conversation off of this, keep the best and wholesale the rest. And that's kind of been how you've structured your career in real estate, right? You yeah, got into exactly deal right. flow wholesale, and then you've built the portfolio on this. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because I, I always refer to my first 10 years as doing it wrong. So, <laughs> You know, basically, I started whenever I was 20 years old in college, and I bought my first house at the age of 20, and um, I did what was referred to as house hacking, mm. which basically just means you buy a property, you live in either one of the bedrooms or one of the units, and then you rent out the other bedrooms or units, you know, assuming it's a, if it's a multifamily or a single-family house. So the first house I bought was a four-bedroom house. It was in Columbia, Missouri, where I was going to school. And I lived in one of the rooms and I rented out the other three. And, you know, that basically allowed me to live for like about a hundred bucks a month. You know, after mm -hmm. collecting the rent from the, you know, my buddies who were living in the other three bedrooms. And, uh, you know, we all would split the utility bills. At, in the end, you know, it cost me about a hundred bucks a month for, you know, utilities and room and board. So, you know, it was a great little strategy, but... You know, I bought that house full retail off the MLS and I went and got an 80% loan on it. And mm -hmm. that house was a $150,000 house. So, you know, 80% loan means that I had to bring 20% down or to the table. And 20% yep. of $150,000 is $30,000. Well, I didn't have that thirty grand. I borrowed it from my grandparents and my aunt and uncle and my just some friends. And, and basically... Um, you know, borrowed the 20% to put down, which was debt. And then I mm -hmm. went to the bank and I borrowed the other 80% that was needed. So I, I financed my first property a hundred percent. And then yeah. over the next two or three years, I paid back the 30 grand that I borrowed from my friends and family to, to get into it. And I did that three times while I was in college. So I actually graduated okay. college with three rental properties, you know, at the age of 23, 24 years old, whatever it is. And, you know, in the beginning, I did it wrong, though, because I was, you know, borrowing or putting down the 20 percent. Mm -hmm. After college, I had various jobs in sales and marketing and um, continued to buy rental properties. And I think, you know, at the end of my 20s, you know, let's say, you know, at, by the time I was about 29, I think I had uh, 12 rentals. 
So basically over the first 10 years of my investing career, I had gotten to 12 rentals, which is pretty good. But all 12 of those rentals, I had to either put down 20% um, from savings or borrow that money from friends and family and then get an 80% loan and then go pay them back over the course of a year or two. Yeah. So again, yeah. it was it was a success. Like looking back, like I'm so glad that I did that and 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 you know use that that method and that strategy. But now uh, I don't put down 20% on properties. I use the Burr method to mm. acquire them, and I use the equity that I capture in those deals as my down payment. So we use a little bit different method than we did in the beginning. I, I like to refer to the beginning as you know doing it wrong. Because mm -hmm. I had to, I had to essentially have twenty percent. So the average property I buy then and now it's about one hundred fifty grand, mm -hmm. and twenty percent is thirty thirty k. So if you don't have the thirty k to put down, you need to get it somehow. And that's what mm -hmm. I did. I would just go borrow it from people, or you know, towards my late twenties, I had jobs or I was running small businesses, and I'd save the twenty five or thirty grand yep. that was needed, right? But I was still, no matter what, the first ten years. Even if it was borrowed money or savings, I was putting down 20%, which roughly equated to about 30 grand per mm -hmm. property, right? Mm -hmm. And it was slow. So, you know, I look at it like I got lucky two of those 10 years. From yeah. the age of 20 to the age of 30, two of those years, I was able to buy two houses in a year instead of one. <laughs> Hence, I had 12 properties at the end of 10 years and not 10. So, you know, two years, I actually did pretty good. But the other, you know, eight years, I just bought a house a year. It wasn't anything, you know, too crazy or too fast. Mm -hmm. And to kind of skip forward, um, you know, I learned about... So at, at the age of 30, um, I decided that I was tired of working for other people. I was tired of having a boss. And I had various entrepreneurial businesses, you know, at, at the time as well. But none of them were really taken off. You know, they were just kind of uh, just doing okay. And, you know, I was, I was A, tired of working for other people and having a job, and B, I was just tired of just just, just getting by, you know, just mm -hmm. okay. So I decided at the age of 30, I'm 37 going on 38 now, but at the age of 30, you know, I said, I'm going to go full-time in this real estate business. I'm going to make it work. I don't really know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. And I never wanted to be an agent. You know, that even today, I don't have any desire to be an agent. Um, so I decided that I was just going to be an investor at the age of 30 and I had 12 rentals already. So I had a little head start on most people, um, mm -hmm. but not, a, not, a, not, not much, you know, and long story short, Kyle, I discovered wholesaling. I discovered direct to seller marketing and the fact that you don't need to go buy, find and buy properties on the local MLS. You don't need to have a real estate agent help you find those deals that you can actually, you know, go online and pull lists of, of uh, vacant houses or absentee owned properties and you can send mail to these people and connect mm -hmm. with them directly. And that's kind of how I started. I was pulling lists of just those two things, vacants and absentees, and I was sending mail. And we still do that to this day. Now we do a little bit more. We'll, we'll cold call and cold text. We'll still send um, snail mail, like postcards and letters. Mm -hmm. We'll also send emails to people. Um, we do a lot of other types of marketing as well, like, you know, pay-per-click and, and social media marketing. We've even done some, some mass media like billboards and radio, never been mm. on television, but don't rule it out. You know, maybe I'll do that <laughs> at some point, but yeah, for the most part at 30, I went full time. I discovered direct to seller marketing, which led me into, uh, wholesaling. And for those that aren't aware, wholesaling is, uh, basically flipping houses without buying them first. It's pretty mm. cool. So what mm. we do is we find somebody direct to seller that has a problem property, right? It's either the property is distressed or maybe they themselves are dealing with some sort of distress situation in their life. And typically speaking, the three D's are a good way to describe what that looks like. Death, divorce, and disease. These aren't things that I wish upon anybody, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody wants these things to happen to them. In fact, I don't like hearing about these things. But when somebody dies, when somebody gets divorced or when somebody gets a disease, you know, there tends to be a level of motivation to sell a property to help their other situation. 
So again, there's mm -hmm. other reasons that somebody may be a motivated seller. Maybe they're behind on their mortgage payments. Maybe they haven't paid their taxes on their property. Maybe they haven't paid their income taxes. Maybe they're moving out of state for a job. Again, death, divorce, and, divorce and disease can typically be high, highly motivational factors. But whenever somebody has these issues in their life, you know, they often own a property that they need to sell. And that's where we come in. And I say we, not, not even referring to me as, as in myself, but we as in all the investors out there, right? Mm. I'm going to speak for all of us real estate investors here. You know, what we do at the end of the day is, is really very simple. It's very simple. What is it? Well, we, we provide convenience to people in exchange for a discount. That's it. That's all we do. It's so simple. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the convenience typically looks like a cash offer, a fast closing, and an as-is purchase. It's very simple. Three things. Okay. Now, there could be a hundred other things that we could do to provide convenience to people. Uh, for example, helping them load a moving truck or providing a moving company or truck for them. Right? Those would be some other examples of convenience. But most people, they want cash. They want it quick. And they don't want to make any repairs or do any cleaning to the property. That's it. It's so simple. So we come in, we offer convenience, but in exchange for that convenience, Kyle, we demand a discount. I don't pay mm -hmm. retail for properties. And in fact, over the last, uh, you know, seven or eight years, like you had said, you know, in my bio, um, I've wholesaled about 750 houses, maybe even a little more than that. Um, and every one of those properties I was able to buy direct from a seller at a massive discount. Mm -hmm. And uh, the cool thing about wholesaling is, is you don't need to buy the property before you can sell it. So the way that works is I find somebody direct to the seller that has a problem and I offer them convenience, like I just stated. And in exchange for that convenience, I get a discount. So let's say that, you know, you have a property that maybe would sell as is for a hundred thousand, but I come in and I say, I'll give you 85,000 cash. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, for that property. And they say, yeah, it's a little lower than what I'd like, but I need the money bad. You know, I'm dealing with this issue in my life and I send them an offer to purchase that property for 85,000, but I don't actually buy it. I just have a contract on it. And then mm -hmm. what I do is I then take it to my network of investors, which I've built up over time. And I actually teach people how to do this as well. Um, and I just say, Hey, I got this deal. You know, the as is value is probably around 100. I have it at 85, but I'll sell it for 95. So I'll give the, you know, the, the investor a, a deal. I mean, they may, they may be willing to pay 100 for it, but I can get it to them for 95. But mm -hmm. my price is 85. So what I do is I essentially just get out of the way. I locate a deal. I get control of it. I find somebody else that wants it, that's willing to pay me a premium on it, but still leave meat on the bone for them, of course. And then I just get out of the way and I essentially sell my contract for them for 10 grand. So they see that I'm paying 85, they pay me 10. So they've already paid that or they pay it at closing and then they can step into my shoes and they can go buy and close on that property for 95. And that's what wholesaling is. It's just using paperwork to gain control of a property and then to sell that contract to purchase it. You got to think you're not really selling the property. You're selling the ability to buy it. It's mm. a, there's a difference there, right? Uh, so that's what wholesaling is. So you had mentioned in my bio whenever you were wrapping up, you know, I have a motto and it's keep the best and wholesale the rest. Yep. And, um, you know, that's, that's kind of how I live my life at my office. Everybody on my team knows that. So whenever we're doing marketing, we're marketing for deals. It doesn't necessarily have to be for, you know, big houses or small houses or, you know, nice neighborhoods or bad neighborhoods. We're just marketing for deals. Anybody that's got a vacant house, a motivated seller, you know, absentee owned is, a, is, is also another reason that somebody would be motivated. And then, of course, all the things I mentioned, death, divorce, disease, so on and so forth. Well, we try to locate these people. And again, we know that the situation that they're going through or going, you know, dealing with isn't a pretty one, you know, so we're obviously not going to try to take advantage of people by because they're going through these situations. But what we are going to do is we're going to offer to help them. And we're going to be 100%. very pretty transparent about the fact that we are investors and that we're doing this for a profit. You know, I don't ever buy a property to lose money or break even. That wouldn't make me a very good investor. I'm mm -hmm. always trying to make a profit. So I lead with that. I'm like super transparent. I tell sellers, 
when I'm on the phone with them, hey, I'm going to buy this. I'm going to fix it up and I'm going to sell it. I'm going to make 30 grand. If you have a problem with that, don't sell it to me. Yeah, exactly. But guess what? I can make your life super convenient, right? If you give me a deal that will allow me to buy it, fix it up and sell it and make 30 grand profit, I will make your life extremely easy. I will make the process of selling this property, hopefully to me, very, very simple, right? Mm -hmm. I'll come out, I'll pay you the cash. I'll close relatively quick, a couple weeks, three, four weeks, which is much faster than putting it on the market and, you know, it it may or may not sell, right? And then I do all my own inspections. I don't require them to fix the property up or to make any repairs. I don't even ask them to clean it out. I buy properties that from hoarders all the time and there's five or six dumpsters worth of crap in that house. Yeah. That's my problem, not theirs. I tell them like, that's the convenience. Like you can literally take what you want and walk away and leave all of that problem for me. It's my problem now. So that's basically what we do. We, we market for deals and then the whole buy the, or keep the best and wholesale the rest motto comes in because if it is a good property, that's, you know, meets my buy box, it might make for a good rental or a good, easy, fun fix and flip. We'll keep it, keep the best. Yep. And then the ones that don't make for good deals or they're too far away or they're too small or too big or not a nice neighborhood or maybe it's too nice of a neighborhood and I don't want to go, you know, spend 300 grand rehabbing it. I wholesale those to other investors. Hmm. So it really is a great tool to have in your belt as an investor, the ability to wholesale because it allows you to turn, you know, a good deal into profit without having to A, buy it or B, fix it. So wholesaling is definitely one of my favorite strategies. But the problem with wholesaling, Kyle, is wholesaling is a transaction treadmill. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, is once you do a deal and get paid, hey, go celebrate. Go buy yourself a nice steak dinner or maybe go take a vacation to the mountains or the beach. Whatever your fancy is, go do that. Have some fun. But when you get back from that dinner or that vacation... You got to start over again. You got to start marketing again. You got to run a bunch of appointments, send a bunch of offers and try to find that next deal. And, you know, we're constantly doing this. But if that's all you're doing, Kyle, it can be a lot of work. Essentially, I know people that they quit their full time job to get into real estate and they go from working 40 hours a week to 60 hours a week. And the reason they quit their job (laughs) in the first place was to work less. So I see this almost every day. You know, people leave in their 40 hour, you know, nine to five to then go work 60 or 70 hours. And, you know, that's okay because you're working for yourself, but you haven't necessarily, you know, uh, shifted into freedom. Right? Yes. That's correct. Kind of the opposite, 100%. Right? You, you found yourself so a nice jail job, right? Yeah, there, there you it's go. Your own, it's your own jail. You own the jail, but it's still You jail, own the right? jail now. Right, right. So the reason that I love rental properties is because they avoid the transaction treadmill. Once you Mm. buy a property and you rent it out, well, every month that you own that property, every month that that property is rented is a better way to word that you, you should in fact create cash flow, which is basically just, uh, excess of all the expenses. So a perfect example is, you know, let's say I can buy a house and I can fix that house up and I can get it rented and the amount of money that that I, uh, you know, have an expenses to own that house every month might be 800 bucks. That's what the mortgage is that might, that might include the taxes or the insurance, you know, Mm -hmm. maybe include some vacancy and, or a little bit of maintenance, but you know, 800 bucks is what it's going to cost me to own that property. Well, if I can rent that property out for 1200 bucks a month, that's a $400 surplus every single month that I own it and have it rented. Well, $400 may not be that much money, to, you know, a lot of the listeners, but if you have 10 houses that make you 400 a month, that's four grand. Mm -hmm. And if you have a hundred of those houses that make you $400 a month, that's 40 grand. That's huge, man. I love it. I love it. It's duplication, man. That's duplication. So that's why I love rental property because a, it avoids the transaction treadmill. Once you get one and you get it rented and you get, find yourself some good tenants you know, you're going to get paid every month, regardless if you're here at home or at your office, or maybe you're on the beach or in the mountains skiing and you're not working, you still get paid. So I love yes. rentals just for that reason. But again, we still wholesale properties because 
it's an easy way to unload inventory. And at the same time, you have to understand that we're helping people. We're helping people that are in distressed situations get out of those situations. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side of that, Kyle, we're helping investors, other landlords, other fix and flippers like myself, find their next deal. And they're more than yeah. happy to pay five, ten, twenty thousand bucks in some cases to you know to the investor in the middle, the wholesaler, to bring that deal to them on a silver platter. Mm -hmm. So everybody wins in the in a traditional wholesale example. Everybody wins. Uh, yeah. But again, I like to keep the best and wholesale the rest because if I wholesale everything, and by the way, I did that for about three years. So you okay. know, at 30, yeah, 30 years old, I jumped in full time. And I, I'm going to be honest, I saw wholesaling as a big, shiny object. I still kind of do. <laughs> and I lost track, Kyle, of my mission. I think this is, we hear this all the time too, David. Wholesaling is kind of the sexy thing. It's high cash. It's yeah. quick. You can keep going. But you, you, I love how you put the transaction treadmill part. That's what it is. So you, what it you, is. I was one of my, that was one of my questions is, did you get stuck on the treadmill for a while? And I, yeah, I did for three, to. three to three, maybe three and a half years even. And it was good. You know, I was making six figures. I was working, you know, 20, 30 hours a week. You know, I was I was doing good, but I wasn't really getting ahead in my own eyes, right? I was just kind of spinning my tires. I was on this treadmill that just, mm -hmm. you know, the faster you run, the faster the belt starts to move, so you don't really get ahead. So, you know, about four years ago, give or take, I, I woke up one day, and I, and I just looked in the mirror, and I'm like, man, what am I doing? Like, I'm doing hundreds of deals, and I'm making good money. But at the same time, I'm not creating more passive income. I'm not, mm. I'm not acquiring more rentals. And that's what I did. And that's what I started with. I started with rental investing. Yep. So I basically just had a little epiphany, Kyle. And I was like, you know what? Now that I have this skill of marketing direct to sellers and finding deals and getting good deals under contract, I'm going to pivot back to buying rentals. Because now I don't have to go do what I did in the beginning, the way I did it wrong for 10 years, and pay full retail for properties. Now I can buy properties at a 20 or 30% discount to what they're truly worth and enter the Burr method. So yes. the Burr method, for those that don't know, it's a simple strategy and it's an acronym. Burr in itself is an acronym. It's B with four R's. And the strategy is really the way I define it. I've written a book on it. The way I define it is it is a strategy that allows us to acquire assets very rapidly, if you want, of course, with little to no money. That's the definition. Mm -hmm. I'll say it again. The Burr method is a strategy to acquire assets rapidly, if you want, with little to none of your own money. It's an amazing strategy. So what is it? How does it work? What's the acronym? B four R's, Dave, what is it? Well, I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. The B stands for buy. But really, it's buy at a discount. Because the yep. bigger discount you buy, you get on the front end, the easier the strategy gets. So I would never recommend anybody try to go use the Burr, ma the Burr method and go pay full retail on market for a property. That doesn't, that's that's right. not going to get a, you anywhere. That's a key component of it. The key right. component. So, so B stands for buy at a discount. Not just buy, but buy at a discount. And then there's four R's. And these R's are really, they're relatively straightforward. The first R is you're going to rehab the property, Kyle. Rehab it, fix it up, make it nice. The second R is to rent out the property. And by renting it out, it goes from being a liability into, in, into an asset. Hmm. The difference between an asset and a liability is so simple, most people don't even know what it is. And I'll tell you right now, assets put money in your pocket every week, month, or quarter maybe even annually in some cases, but they put mm -hmm. money in your pocket for owning them. Liabilities take money out of your pocket for owning them. So the, the house that you live in, unless you're renting out rooms, it's a liability. It costs you money every yeah. month to own it. The car you drive, even if it's paid off, it's in an asset unless you're using it to, to Uber or Lyft, right? Yep. That car is a liability. You have to put gas in it. You got to maintain it. You got to insure it. It costs money to own it. Well, rental properties are assets once they're rented because they actually pay you every month to own them. 
right? So right. again, there's four R's. The first R is rehab. The second R is rent. The third R is refinance with a bank or a credit union. And the mm -hmm. fourth R is literally just to repeat the process over and over and over again. So the difference of why we use the Burr method now and why it's the right way to invest versus the first 10 years, Kyle, where I, I did okay. I got 12 rentals under my belt, but I put down 30 grand on every one of those. Let's do some yeah, math. Yeah, high equity, man. You're let's, right. Oh, my You're God. Right. Let's do some math. 30,000. I'm going to get my calculator out. Times 12 is 360 grand. That's yeah. how much money I either had to save to put down or borrow to put down and then pay back. That's a lot of money. Yeah, and I that's don't a lot encourage to show up. anybody to go do what I did. There's a better way. And that method is the Burr method. So here's how we do it now we still put down 30 grand, except for we don't have to save it or borrow it. We earn it. So here's how we mm -hmm. do it. We will go out and find a property direct to the seller, which I explained and described already. And we will get a discount on that property. So we will buy it at a discount. So I will buy a property for, let's say, 80 cents on the dollar. Mm -hmm. But in exchange for getting that discount, I'm offering convenience to the seller in some way, shape, or form, right? Yep. So now I've captured 20% equity already when I bought it. And I actually buy it. So I will use a hard money lender or a private money lender, and I will borrow the money that's needed to buy it and fix it from a lender. So I don't use any of my own money to do it. I borrow all of it. So I'll buy it at a discount. Next step is to rehab it. Well, I'm going to rehab that property. And there's a reason that I like to rehab a property. Actually, there's two or three reasons. Number one, it's going to help my appraisal, which is going to happen later, mm -hmm. right? Number two, it's going to mitigate or defer most of the maintenance that the property is going to need in the next five, seven, maybe even 10 years. Mm -hmm. So like, Make for instance, a, a roof yeah. and an HVAC, I'm going to, I'm going to put those on. I'm going to do those when I buy the property. So I don't have to mess with it three or five or seven years later. Ideally I can get 10 or 12 years out of a property before mm -hmm. I got to go in and do major updates to it again. Right. Nice. And then yeah. number three reason why I rehab a property is so I can charge more rent. If I have a property that has a 15 year old kitchen versus one that's got a 15 day old kitchen, which one yep. do you think is going to rent for more money? Obviously mm -hmm. the one with the newer kitchen. So when we rehab a property, we're updating it. We're able to make the value go up, which maybe takes my equity from 20 to 25% or 30% now because I've mm -hmm. increased the value with my rehab. And then number three is I'm able to charge more in rent. So it's like a win, win, win when you rehab. Oh, and by the way, I borrow the money to buy it and rehab it up front from a private or a hard money lender. I don't ever use my own money. Yeah, there you go. So then the second R, so first R, so buy, that's the B. First R is rehab. Second R is to rent. So then I'm going to go rent the property out. I'm either going to do that myself or I'm going to have a property manager do it for me. All right? And, it's, mm -hmm. and then at, at that point, it becomes an asset. It's bringing yep. in more money than I have to pay every month to the lender for the loans of the purchase and the rehab. So then the third R is the refinance. And that's where I walk into a bank. And here's the big difference. In the beginning, the first 10 years, I would locate a property, I'd put a contract on it, then I'd walk into a bank. There wasn't any rehab typically being done. Uh, and the bank's going to say, hey, Dave, we're going to give you an 80% loan. Well, here's the problem. The purchase price was equal to what it appraised for. Yep. So they're going to give me an 80% loan based upon what I'm willing to pay for it, which is the purchase price, assuming that it appraises at or below that number. I'm sorry, at or above that number, right? That's right, yep. But at yep. the end of the day, the appraisal is typically going to come in right at about the purchase price. That's typically, right, yeah. Typically right So if you're paying number. more, you're paying more, you're going to, you're going to, the, the bank's always going to give you less than that is what you're saying. They're you going to give you an 80% of what that number is. So it doesn't matter if that number is 150000 or a, or a dollar. You still 100%. have to have 20% of that down, period. Yep. Right. 20% is 20%. It, it's going to matter on what the number you're putting that 20% to, but yeah, 20% is 20%. That's what you got to put down. So in the beginning, I was going to the banks asking for purchase loans. Well, I never ask a bank for a purchase loan. Now I ask a hard money or a private money lender for a purchase loan. I buy okay. it. I rehab it. I rent it. 
And then I go to the bank. And instead of walking in the bank saying, hey, Mr. Banker, let's just say John. John's the banker. Hey, John, mm -hmm. I'm looking to, you know, instead of me going in and saying, hey, I want to buy this property. Now what I do is I say, hey, John, I already own it. It's already in my name. And mm -hmm. I owe this other guy, let's say Kyle, or that's your name. Let's go with Chris. Chris mm -hmm. was my private lender on the deal. I already owe Chris. Would you have interest in refinancing this to where I owe you guys the money instead of Chris, John? And John says, of course, David, we would love to do business with you. So guess what? Chris says, we're going to give you 80% of what it appraises for. Well, the big difference now is, is that what I paid for the property is irrelevant. In the beginning, I'm basically paying full appraisal. Well, now yep. if I can get a 20% discount on the purchase, I can rehab it, maybe add an additional 5 or 10% value or equity capture because I can force mm -hmm. the appreciation up with that rehab. That's I get right. it rented, and then I go to the bank, and I say, hey, I want to refinance. The bank doesn't ask me what I paid for the property. What they say is they say, hey, Dave, we're going to give you 80% of what it appraises for. So my goal with using the Burr method, Kyle, is to be all in, all, all, all. All the purchase, all the rehab, all the holding costs, all the all the uh, interest that I might owe my lender, all the utilities, all the taxes, all the insurance, all everything, all, all. If I can be all in at 80% of what it appraises for, and a bank's going to lend me 80% of what it appraises for, I can take the money from the bank loan and pay back all of those debts and acquire yep. that asset with no money out of pocket. There's the net zero. So I'm, yep. still, I'm still basically putting, I don't want to say down 20% because I'm not, but I'm gaining that 20% value by mm -hmm. doing it that way through the method. So the bank no longer cares what I paid for the property. Now they just want to know that it appraised for X and they're going to lend 80% of X. And if I'm all in at that number, I now get to refinance and pay back the private or hard money lender that I borrowed all the money from in the beginning to get into yep. the deal. And they're made whole and they're happy. And they're basically like, Dave, when can we do it again? Yeah, you know, I don't make the, money whenever I have hour. my money back. I want to lend it to you so I can have you pay me an interest rate on it, right? Well, That's if I can right. be all in at 80% or less, and in some, some cases, Kyle... I'll be all in at 70 or 75% of what it appraises for. And the bank will actually let me pull a little money out so I can mm -hmm. pay back my lender for the purchase, the rehab, all the interest. And I might even walk with five or 10,000. How yeah, awesome yeah. is that? So, that's awesome. That's the beauty of it. The Burr, the Burr strategy. And for people that I haven't heard of this before, man, what an in-depth walkthrough from a guy that's done this over <laughs> and over and over again. Right. And there's so many nuggets in there, David. And I will, we're going to take a little break. Yeah. We're going to come back. I want to dive into some of these tactics you've uh, you've explained, some of these, uh, um, just your story in general. And I also want to get your take on the market a little bit. So we're going to yeah. we're going to do a little break, and then we'll be right back. You got it, man. Thanks, Kyle. Hey, wanted to take a quick break from this week's episode. Wondering if you ever ask yourself, how do I get started in this stuff? Or if I'm already doing it, what are some next steps or people that are doing the same thing that I want to do, people on this passive income journey? Well, we were getting that question and we created a community of passive income investors called Passive Income University. This is a place where you can watch videos, things that we've done, where we put tools and information, where we've built a community of people that can communicate, ask questions, and grow together to start their passive income journey. And eventually we complete our passive income journey together. If you're interested in more info on Passive Income University, check us out at p25kg.com. All right, we are back with episode eight, Wholesaling Real Estate Plus the Burst Strategy with David Dodge. David, I just wanna say this, if, if the audience members didn't catch the first half, for some reason, if they're jumping in the middle of this thing, go back and listen to that first half and all the nuggets you were dropping in there, man. You know, I wanna talk to, real quick, how you made the switch, because you explained your story so well. You were doing the slow route. You kind, you kind of called it the 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 wrong way or the you know the dumb way of doing it. Was it. Slow it, it, yeah. it was the slow route. It was the slow. It was the slow route to start. And one of the most compelling parts of your bio, your story, is the scale in which you've been able to achieve. And you explain how you came ac came across wholesaling, partnered with the Burr strategy, 
started using other people's money for speed, started being able to get the deal flow working in your favor. You know, you said you did it the hard way for a while. When did you kind of have the aha that it's like, I, if I want to achieve my goals, I need to change. I can't be having $30,000 of equity tied up on every property. I think a lot of listeners are stuck in that snag right now, David. Yeah, absolutely. Where they're like, they're saving well. They've got professional jobs, but they're working hard. Money's coming in. They're even being strategic with other investing. Oh, but then it's all for eight, nine, 18 months of savings, one property, one right? Property. When, right. When did this, you know, what, what can you speak to for our audience that want to yeah. hit the accelerator so, a little bit, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, like I said, the first 10 years I got, I got 12 properties and that's, you know, if you average it at about 30 grand a property, that's $360,000 that you'd have either have to borrow and put down and pay back or save yep. up to then put down. And you know, I didn't really know that there was any other way to do it until I discovered uh, the Burt method. So yes. wholesaling was, you know, when I went full time, I just I didn't want to be an agent again, you know, and I just was like, how do I get into this business and be a full time investor without a ton of money? You know, I, yes. I essentially had, you know, a little bit of money, but not a ton. And I put that into marketing and then the marketing got me into wholesaling and I, you know, did really well with wholesaling. Yeah. Yep. But the lessons that I learned for those first, you know, let's say three, three and a half years of just doing wholesaling full time was how to find good deals, how yes. to market direct to seller, how to negotiate and, you know, how to win deals, how to get properties under contract. Yes. And solve problems for, se for sellers. You, you explain that enough. Problems. Our audience is hearing a few of the same themes from other episodes now where I hear you say things like transparency, options, you're creating certainty for these sellers. You're being, you're you're helping. You're providing convenience with, like Correct. you said, cash, as is condition, fast Bam. closing. Yep. You were able to. That's what entrepreneurs do: is solve problems. That's right. That was that was one of the skills you said, and I think that that's so important to note because that's a free skill. That's yeah. something oh, you absolutely. can learn how to solve problems, think critically. And then create relation. You also mentioned that with the, with uh, with a yep, lot of your all sellers. the above, all very very important. So all of my wholesaling, you know, and again, we still wholesale a couple deals a month on a good month. On a bad month, we'll probably do one or two. So we're still doing mm. a lot of them, right? Um, but basically, you know, after about three and a half years of of wholesaling full time, um, I was just, you know, again, I kind of had an epiphany, and I'm like, man, I got into real estate at the age of 20 because I wanted to be a landlord and I wanted passive income. And over the last three and a half years, I hadn't even bought a single rental property. Like I basically took three and a half years off of buying rentals and just wholesale. Yeah. I, I had done several hundred wholesale deals over that three and a half year time. And basically though, because I had learned all these skills on how to market and how to find people directly and how to get them on the phone and how to negotiate with them and how to provide convenience in exchange for a discount. You know, these were such great skills because once I kind of, you know, had the epiphany of, Man, I'm not really so like I don't think wholesaling is investing. I think wholesaling yeah. is marketing. That's really mm -hmm. what it is. You market to find a deal, and then once you find it and get it under contract, you have to then market that contract to purchase to your investor pool. It's yeah. a marketing business. Yep. So personally, I don't think wholesaling is investing. Man, and I that's was investing a huge for 10 too. years. Yeah, I was investing for 10 years, and I took three and a half years off. But that three and a half year off hundreds of deals. And I learned valuable lessons on, you know, how to find the sellers and how to negotiate and how to get these properties under contract. So then when I decided to go back into investing, I now had all this fuel to throw on my fire, right? Mm -hmm. So I knew how to find discounted properties at deals. And instead of me going and locking these properties up and then finding a buyer, I then pivoted to just find a, find a lender, find a, yeah. a local you know, person or even company, private or hard money, right? Yep. To lend me. So instead of me, so nothing really changed on the front end. I was still marketing for deals. I was now, but now when I'd find a good one that I liked, I would keep it. So keep the best and I would still yeah. wholesale the ones that didn't make the most sense. I'd still wholesale those. That's right, man. So that was the big pivot. And then Dude, I would and, borrow and the money there, to buy. Go ahead. Then there's, and I love, I just wanted to share, throw a comment out there. Your mindset too, you mentioned the word freedom 
it's almost like you went from, uh, well, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like short-term vision, transaction treadmill, making good money to, wait a second, my goals are long-term. My goals are freedom. My goals Correct. are time, yep. right? Was, yep. And that's such an important thing. I think for a lot of us in careers, I'm in real, I'm a real estate agent. You get in the sales treadmill, man. And that's like, how do you get out of that, right? Yeah. Unless you change to a freedom disposition where you want long-term goals, you want to start stacking the pennies and keeping the pennies, you know? So that I, I hear that switch. And I remember asking you, this was years ago now, David, when we first interacted, but I said, David, why do you wholesale, man? What, what's your goals? And you said, more rental properties. And I was like, Oh my gosh, every other wholesaler tells me their goal is to create cash. Well, why you create cash? Usually to buy long-term assets, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, so it was yeah, just So to me, wholesaling is kind of a means to an end. It's a marketing business and it allows me to disposition deals that I don't want to keep. So if I mm -hmm. come across a deal that I don't want, but I know it's a deal, well I can turn that deal into 5 or 10 grand that then I will then use for more marketing to find the deals that I want to own and keep and hold. Right? Yes. So yes. to me, wholesaling is a marketing business. It's not investing. And whenever we say keep the best and wholesale the rest, if we find a good deal on a property, and what I mean by deal is, is like a discount. It's that simple. It's a discount. If yes. I find a property in the hood that I don't want to buy, but I can get it for 60 cents on the dollar, and I know somebody that would pay 70 cents on the dollar. So again, I'm leaving meat on the bone, right? But yeah. I can make five, 10, 15, 20 grand in the process. Well, then I'm going to take that money and I'm going to put it right back into marketing so I can then find a good deal in a neighborhood that I want to buy and hold in. Hmm. So to me, sense, you know, wholesaling is a marketing business and it allows me to find deals that I can cherry pick. That's really what it comes down to at the end of the day. Most yes. wholesalers... You know, especially newbies, they're not cherry picking. They're just wholesaling everything. And that's fine. Yeah. But yeah. after a while, you get kind of tired of it. And it's, again, it's a transaction treadmill. So what yeah. I decided to do, let's just say four years ago for simple math. Four years ago, I, again, I woke up and I, I realized that I wasn't really on the track that I started on. I was on a different track. The one I mm. started on was slow and steady, but it was slow and steady. I was acquiring rentals slow and steady. Well, then I took a three and a half year break and I did a ton of deals, but I hadn't acquired a single rental property. I still had 12. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to take the skills that I learned from this marketing business and I'm going to put these into play to find deals for myself. So I don't have to go to the MLS and hire an agent and pay full retail. Yeah. Now what yeah. I can do is I can do the same thing I did but I'm going to bring in the Burr method. So enter the Burr method. So now we'll use our marketing from our wholesaling efforts to locate good deals. If mm -hmm. they don't make sense for us and they don't meet our buy box, we wholesale them. But if yep. they do, we cherry pick those and keep them. And then we'll, we'll go to a private or hard money lender. We'll borrow the money that we need to buy it and to rehab it. I don't like to use any of my own money. Yep. So I'm going to borrow all of it. I'm going to buy the property. It's going to be in my name. I'm going to fix that property up. And again, there's three reasons that we do that. Number one is, is we're going to mitigate all the maintenance and capital expenditures for hopefully the next seven to 10 years. Mm -hmm. Number two, it's going to increase the value of the appraisal, which is what we're going to get the loan on in the end anyway. So we're going to yeah. force appreciation. So we're, we're gaining equity. We're capturing equity when we buy it at a discount. And then we're adding equity by fixing that property up. And then number three is, is if we have a nice updated property with newer items and, you know, nice and clean and fresh, you're going to be able to charge more rent for it too. So there's so yeah, many advantages man. to rehabbing. Like rehabbing is my best friend. I love to rehab yes, properties. Yes, yes, right? absolutely. And then we get it rented. And then again, here's the last and final step, not including repeat because that just goes without saying. Repeat is self-explanatory. But the last step in the Burr method or the third R is to refinance. And here's the difference. Again, I'm not walking in the bank saying, hey, I want to buy this property. Will you help me? Because they're going to say, yeah, of course we will. We're going to give you 80% of what you're going to buy it for. You're going to need that 20%, mm. period. Now, I've already owned the property, so I'm no longer asking the bank to help me buy something. I already own it at this point. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the bank and I'm going to say, hey, I got this property. Oh, and by the way, Mr. Banker, I think we were referring to that guy as John as in our example. Mm. 
Mr. Mm-hmm. John Banker. By the way, I just spent 20, 25, 30 grand fixing this property up. And then that banker's eyes and ears are going to open up big and wide because now in the event that they give me a loan on the property and I default, meaning I don't make the payments and they have to foreclose and take that property away from me. It's never happened and hopefully won't ever happen. But yep. in the event that it does, do you think that banker and that lender is going to be more likely to lend money to me on a property that just rehabbed or one that needs a bunch of rehab? Well, obviously, mm-hmm. they're taking risk by, by giving you a loan. So if you can present them a property that just has a brand new roof and a brand new kitchen and a brand new plumbing stack and brand new flooring and brand new paint and brand new light fixtures, that's going to make it easier for them to sell it in the event that they have to take it back. Mm -hmm. So I'm also mitigating a lot of the banker's risk by bringing them a property that was just rehabbed versus the first 10 years when I was finding properties that didn't necessarily need a bunch of rehab, but they had, they had some, some outdated features. Well, now all the properties features are brand new. So when we go to the yeah, refinance stage, here's the, here's the biggest thing. I'm not asking them for a loan anymore. I'm asking them for a refinance, a mm-hmm. refinance. You know, some people will say refinance. Some people will say refinance. It's the same thing. <laughs> same thing. Same but I'm thing. asking them to give me a loan on this freshly updated property. And then here's what they do. They say, hey, Dave, great. No problem. We're going to send out the appraiser. And this time we're going to give you 80% of what it appraises for. So mm-hmm. they're still giving you an 80% loan. But the difference is, is the purchase price matters when you're buying a property with a bank. It yes, doesn't yeah. matter when you're refinancing. So if you yes. can buy it at a discount, add a little bit of value from your rehab, which does multiple things, of course, and then you can go get a loan from a bank and they say, hey, you know, let's just use simple math. Let's say now that the property appraises for 150000 That was the same purchase price in the beginning. But now it appraises for 150,000. Well, what if I bought that property for 80 and I put 30 in it? Mm-hmm. That One means time. that I'm all into that property for 110,000. Well, if the bank's going to give me an 80% loan of 150, they're going to lend me 120 grand. Well, yep, if I yep. borrowed 110 grand, now there's going to be $10,000 extra that I can use to pay my private lender's interest. I can use it to pay closing costs. I can use it to pay taxes. Maybe the bank that I'm refinancing with will let me escrow my taxes and my insurance. Well, I can prepay those. And basically, Mm -hmm. I can acquire the asset with no money out of pocket. So the difference is there's still 20% in play, but I'm not having to come out of pocket for it. I earn it, right? We're going to earn that 20% versus save it or borrow it. And that's the beautiful thing about the Burr method, Kyle, is it allows us, again, let's define it. It's a simple strategy that allows us to buy assets or acquire assets, same thing, Mm -hmm. very rapidly, if you want, I always like that part, with little to no money, right? So we're still buying assets and acquiring them, but we're not having to put the money down, we're earning that money. And then the last R in the Burr method, buy, rehab, rent, refinance, the last R is repeat. And that's mm-hmm. the beautiful thing. It's a very scalable strategy, Kyle. In fact, that makes at sense. any given time, I have anywhere between five and 15 properties somewhere in the Burr method. Either I'm in the buy at a discount phase, or I'm in the rehab phase, or I'm in the property management leasing phase, or maybe I'm in the refinance phase. And sometimes that can take a couple months. If the bank requires some seasoning or maybe they're backed up and they can't close for six weeks, whatever, Mm -hmm. but we're somewhere within that strategy. And again, the last R is simply to repeat, which allows you to do this and it's very scalable. So a lot of people, when they first learn about this method, they think that they can only do one at a time. That's not right. That's wrong. Yeah. I could go buy 10 properties, assuming I have enough private or hard money lenders available, and I could rehab all 10 of them at the same time. I can rent all 10 of them at the same time and I can go to the bank and refinance all 10 of them at the same time. Or, yeah, man. Or I can do two buys and two rehabs and I can have them somewhere within the process. So I think as of today, business is a little slow right now. I think I have seven of them going. And okay. that's slow for me, right? Yeah, so yeah, that's very, slow. very scalable. 
Yeah, and here, so I know a lot of people are listening to this and, and after listening to this, or maybe during, they're Googling how to wholesale, they're Googling, you know, they're, they're going into the Burr method. Um, what, what do you see, like the way you do things makes a lot of sense and you've done this for a long time, but people yeah, that are just getting started. Yeah, about 200 Burr deals to date. Quite yeah, Burr deal, you know, over 750 wholesales. What about do you see new birds. whole? Yeah. What do you see new wholesalers doing wrong with this? Like, what are why are people getting? Well, first and foremost, hiccups? let me let me set the record straight. You don't have to be a wholesaler to use the Burr method. Correct. Ideally, yes. you know how to wholesale because it's going to be a great, a, it's going to be a bunch of skills from your wholesaling endeavors or activities that you can obviously piggyback on while using the Burr method, right? So, yes, yes. you know, to answer your question, what do a lot of wholesalers I see doing wrong? Well, A, they're not looking to get off the transaction treadmill. They're yeah, just looking for fair. more wholesale deals. And here's the thing. That's good and all if you like working hard. I'm pretty lazy, Kyle. I'm going to be honest, man. Like, <laughs> I want to work about 30 hours a week at most, Right. Ideally, I can work about 15 or 20 hours in a week and I'm and I'm good. That's a, that's enough for me. Right. Mm -hmm. I am self-proclaimed lazy. Now, I spend a lot of time helping my students because I really do find passion there. I find reward. It, it be, I find it to be very rewarding and I'm very mm -hmm. passionate about helping other people. Hence all the value I'm given on this podcast today. So the majority of the time that I do spend is helping my students understand how to do it the right way and not do like yes. Dave did for 10 years, do like Dave does today and yeah. learn how to do it the right way. So how do they do that? Well, they need to learn how to market and they need to learn how to find off market deals at deals or at discounts. Very, very yep. important. How to work with private and hard money lenders to raise capital, how to rehab and not go over budget or over rehab how to lease a property and or hire and partner with a property management company. And then last but not least, how to go talk to the bankers, the local banks, local credit unions, and how to refinance and how to get a loan based on the appraised amount, not the purchase price. Yeah, man. You're getting a loan 100%. on that purchase price. I don't care if, again, if it's a $150,000 property or $1, you still have to have 20% to buy it. Yeah, Maybe. man. That's a huge click for people. I think people, are gonna, I think people are going to hear that and... You know, I, I know for a fact, uh, when people are testing this out or listening to this, you know, those skills you talk about for wholesaling, um, you just made the list. These are the things you need to do. Um, and you know, going into kind of ship to, to pivot a little bit towards, Hey, you're in this business, you're in the real estate world, you're investing. You see a lot in this world of real estate investing with consumers, you're in people's homes. Then you're on the other side with lenders, agents, you know, and people investing. The market is a topic of conversation at hand right now with interest rates, the real estate market. Everybody's talking about bubbles. There's a lot of fear in the market right now, David. How are you guys? Well, what's your take on that? And because I want I want people to hear truth from somebody that's in the trenches, not from the yeah. The so I'm gonna be honest. Inventory is light right now, and it has yep. and, and it's and it's not super easy to find a good deal. You got to work hard to find a good because it's a hot market, right? Because it's that's a hot because, market, right? We're we're in a market where inventory are at record lows. So what that means is that there's not a lot of random people out there that are willing to give their property away at fifty cents on the dollar. Yeah. Ideally, I buy property at fifty to sixty cents on the dollar. It mm -hmm. seems like a big discount. But it, if somebody has a big problem in their life and I can help them out and offer convenience, they're okay giving me that big discount because they're more interested in the convenience. So with the inventory yep. being low, Kyle, it has made it a little bit more challenging to find a deal. It's not impossible. It's just a little bit more challenging. So that's the first part. The second yep. part is interest rates are going up. Well, that's due to inflation. When the, when the federal government prints... Two, you know, roughly 40% of all the money that's ever been printed in the last two years, there is going to be inflation. Well, how do you mm -hmm. offset inflation? You, you increase the interest rates. Well, that's definitely not something that's going to be fun. And we're starting to see our loan interest rates go up. But yep. the way to offset that is, is to get into a longer term loan or 
just get a bigger discount on the purchase, mm -hmm. right? So it's not the end of the world. It's not going to slow us down to a screeching halt. Yeah, it's going to slow us down a little bit, but it's not going to stop us all the way by any means. Yep. Number three, people need shelter. I don't care where on earth you live. Snakes and mosquitoes and animals <laughs> will eat you alive if you don't have shelter. Shelter is probably one of the most important things for human beings outside of air and water. You mm -hmm. need air and you need water, but what, what else do you need? You need shelter. So housing to me is one of the most, I'm trying to think of the right verbiage here. It's one of the most important things that we have in our lives, right? We got to stay cold mm -hmm. or stay warm in the cold and, and, and stay cool in the heat. We need yep. shelter. So at the end of the day, unless there is a mass extinction event, which one could have said COVID was, but I didn't think it was, mm -hmm. you know, real estate is only going to be more and more valuable every day. Here's mm -hmm. another thing to think about. As inflation reduces the purchasing power of our dollars that we're earning is, yep. is going to increase the price of goods and services. Well, guess what? Housing is a good and a service. Mm. So if you own real estate and inflation comes, the value of that property is going to go up with inflation. So my goal right now isn't to necessarily slow down or buy less property. It's to buy more because mm. I want to get into debt. I want to, my goal is a hundred million dollars in debt. And I think right now I probably owe the banks about 14 million. So I'm only 14% of the way to where I want to be. Yeah. I want a hundred million dollars in debt. So yeah, another great right. thing about rentals, Kyle, is if you do it the right way and you actually own assets, not vacant properties, those are liabilities, but you own properties that are rented, somebody else is paying off that debt for you, right? So that's yeah, why I want a hundred million dollars worth of debt. Because I'm not going to be the one paying that hundred million back. All of my tenants are. Those yeah, are the over people a certain that are amount of time. You're right. You're right. Absolutely. So to me, you know, to answer your question, and we can wrap it up with this. You know, interest rates are a part of life, right? Yep. They're not going to necessarily help us landlords or us burr and buy and hold investors get get cheaper rates. We're going to have to pay a little bit more. But guess what that also does? It removes a lot of the competition, mm, right? Which yeah, is man. also a good thing when inventory is low. If there's 100 yes. houses for sale at any given time and there's 100 investors looking for them, that means that there's about one house per investor. But if the interest rates drive a bunch of investors out of the marketplace and now there's 100 houses for sale, but only 20 people that are looking to buy them, now yep. that's five houses per investor. Well, that's right. The man. interest rates don't scare me in fact, they kind of get me a little excited because it's going to remove a bunch of my competition. I'm not yeah. going away. So I don't and, really I mean, care about the, the interest rates at the end of the day. Yes, I care because I'm going to pay a little bit more. But as they go up and as they go back down, maybe five or 10 years from now, who knows how long it might take. But I'll be able yep. to refinance again later and get those rates back down. So I'm not that worried about it. The main thing that is making it difficult for people right now, Kyle, is the lack of inventory in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. And I mean, when, when inventory does come back, if this, if this slows the, you know, people are afraid of the slow, there's fear around it. People like yourself or investors, entrepreneurs will be, now's the time to set yourself up to offer solutions when, when people are again, looking for them and the market's not maybe as hot. Right. And I yeah, think and I love this is such people. a good time. Yeah. Like you said, I love coaching people at this point. That's really my passion. You yeah. Know, going out and buying five or 10 houses in a month. I've done that 20 times, mm -hmm. you know, I love doing that by all means, but what I really like to do is I like to see my students get that first rental or maybe they yeah, come man. to me and they already have five or 10 rentals and they want to get it up to 50 rentals and I can help them scale that business up. You know, That's I awesome, love man. when my students quit their jobs. I never encourage them to do so, Yeah. Right? but when they are ready to do that on their own and they do it, I love it. I am celebrating them, right? That's right We're going to have a party on their behalf. They got to quit that job that they probably don't like. You yeah. Know? yeah. So, you know, my passion at this point is, is to really, it's to educate, it's to motivate, and it is in to empower other people 
to use these same skills that I have learned and, and, and basically mastered to acquire mm-hmm. rental properties and rental and real estate at an off market discounted price. So I can then do, like you said in the beginning, keep the best and wholesale, and wholesale the rest. The it's the so rest. simple. Yeah. And the That's ones right, that man. we do keep, we use the Burr method to, to buy, rehab, rent, and refinance them, which allows us to acquire them with little to no money. So Kyle, That's right. over the last, let's say over the last hundred Burr deals that we've done, the average amount of money that we're leaving in a deal is $1,200. So oh, remember in man. the beginning when I was having that's to put, awesome, man. put down 30 grand? Yeah. I've reduced that far cry. from 30,000 to 1,200, 1,200. And if that property cash flows, let's say three or 400 bucks a month, after four or five months, I don't have any money in that deal anymore. It's infinite yep. return. Infinite. That's right. If you can we acquire like an asset with, with no money, money or yeah. even little, yeah. <laughs> In, in a couple months, or maybe even it takes a year or two to pay yourself back if you leave four or five or, or six grand in the property, whatever. That's still a whole lot better than the 30000 that I used to leave in in the very beginning. And that's how most people buy rentals. They save up 20, 30, 40 grand, they put it down, they get a loan. And that's not a bad strategy. It's just not a very scalable one. Yeah. Right? 100%, man. That's so that's 100%. really why I'm so passionate about, you know, real estate in general, but really more so, um, uh, the Burr method to acquire rentals and and really yeah, wholesaling man. is a means to an end. It's a marketing business. Yeah, know? that's a good so. that's a good thing for people to know. Wholesaling is marketing, not investing. I really like that. That's a note that I took. You know, David, you're a coach. You're pouring into people. You're teaching other people. You've given some amazing advice, some amazing next steps, some some different bullet points of where people can go after they're hearing some of this stuff. How do people, uh, you know, in wrapping this up, how do people find you, man? How how, how can people engage with you and, and take advantage of the resources that you provide? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I I would give them two places to go. Number one is Instagram. Everybody's got Instagram or at least has access to a web browser. Uh, my handle on Instagram is my full name, David, D-A-V-I-D, Allen is my middle name, A-L-A-N. And then my last name is Dodge, like the car, D-O-D-G-E. Mm-hmm. So David Allen Dodge on Instagram is my handle. Or if they want to learn more about me, my, uh, my coaching, the Burr method, and want to maybe book a call with, with my team to learn more, the domain for that is wholesalinginc.com forward slash rentals. So mm-hmm. wholesaling is spelled W-H-O-L-E-S-A-L-I-N-G. And then Inc. is I-N-C. So wholesalinginc.com forward slash rentals. Is where those is where people can go. They can learn a little bit more about me. They can learn about the Burr method. They can learn about how to buy rental properties with little to no money. And then, of course, uh, if they have you know interest in working with me or just you know want to jump on the on the phone with one of my team members to just talk about some of their current deals, we would love to chat with you. And you can uh, you can book a call over on that website. Man, David. Well, we just appreciate you being an authentic, open book, providing value. Uh, sharing your world and how you've scaled it, man. It's just so impressive. And I think it's inspiring for me to hear, our listeners to hear, just the different little things, the little ahas you had. Uh, Super valuable uh, podcast with you today, man. And thanks for sharing everything. Hey, thank you so much for having me, man. And thanks for listening. Again, I talk a lot and I get very, I get very passionate yeah, about real it, estate dude. investing. So uh, yeah, I really appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. Yeah, good chat, man. This has been the Passive 25K Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future conversations. Also, tell us what you thought by leaving a comment below on today's topic. If something really hit with you, don't be afraid to share this with someone else that's interested in passive income. Thanks again for tuning in. I'll catch you next time for another episode of the Passive 25K Podcast.